Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the first session of crypto. My name is Bart Prunel, and I have the pleasure to chair this session. We have uh, five talks on symmetric crypto systems. And the first talk is entitled An Enciphering Scheme Based on a Card Shuffle by Viet Tong Huang, Ben Morris, and Phil Wagaway. And Ben will give the talk. Okay. Um, so in um, block cipher construction and the related problem of constructing a pseudorandom permutation from a pseudorandom function, most current methods rely on either variants of FISO networks or substitution permutation networks. Today I'm going to introduce a new method which we call swap or not for which we can prove stronger security results. So in the talk, uh, first I'll talk about how to construct swap or not. And then I'm going to uh, demonstrate its appeal by turning to the problem of constructing a pseudorandom permutation from a pseudorandom function and show that with swap or not, you can prove better bounds than what you can do with FISO. First, some concrete numbers. Um, if we do 1,200 rounds of our cipher, then we can encipher 64-bit strings and give an advantage of less than 10 to the minus 10, even if the adversary queries half the domain. And for social security numbers and credit card numbers, 340 rounds and 500 rounds are enough to make the advantage small even if the number of queries is close to the size of the whole domain. So uh, we're used to seeing security only up to about the square root of the domain size. <clears throat> uh, a nice feature of our cipher is that it works directly on non-binary domains, such as credit card numbers and social security numbers. Um, now, the theoretical problem we're going to consider is the problem of constructing a pseudorandom permutation from a pseudorandom function. And this is a problem that's received a lot of attention, going back to the famous paper of Luby and Rakoff. Now, let me uh, state what's known for enciphering n bit strings. Uh, Luby and Rakoff showed that. Uh, three rounds of balanced FISO, or, or four rounds if you want CCA security, will um, give security provided that the number of queries is around the fourth root of the size of the domain. And this, this can be improved to about the square root of the size of the domain. But there's reason to believe that um, we're not going to be able to prove much better than that for balanced FISO. For un maximally unbalanced FISL, also known as the Thorpe Shuffle, you can improve the exponent to two to the so to, you can improve the exponent to one minus epsilon times n. With swap or not, we can get security even if the adversary queries most of the domain. So for this reason, it's a good solution for the format-preserving encryption problem, which is as follows. Suppose you want to encipher 
social, social security numbers or credit card numbers, say they're entries in a database and you want the results to be of the same form, well, it's, it's not clear how to do this with something like AES because AES is a permutation, but it's a permutation on blocks of 128 bits. It's not clear how to use that to handle these much smaller domains. A good example to consider is the case of social security, security numbers. So here the size is 10 to the ninth. So that's large enough so that we wouldn't want to have to construct a random permutation using brute force. But the square root, that's the bound unbalanced Feistel, is only around 30,000, which is not so big. So swap or not provides a, a good solution to format preserving encryption for these domains of troublesome size. <clears throat> now, our enciphering scheme is based on the card shuffle. So let me say a few words about how you can think of a card shuffle and an enciphering scheme as corresponding to one another. So suppose we have a, a method of shuffling cards. Here I've drawn eight cards. Label the positions as binary numbers going from 0, 0, 0 to 1, 1, 1. Now do a bunch of shuffles. If the card in position 1, 0, 0 is sent to position 1, 0, 1, then if the message is 0, 1, 0, the encoding is 1, 0, 1. If, if a card shuffle is going to make a good enciphering scheme, then it needs to be what Money Neuro called oblivious, which means that you can trace the trajectory of a single card without worrying about what's happening with the other cards. Now here's the swap or not shuffle. At step t, choose kt uniformly at random from the set of n bit strings. Pair each position x with kt x or x. And for each pair of positions, flip a coin. If the coin lands heads, swap the cards at those positions. So notice that KT induces a random matching. Here I've drawn the matching associated with KT equals 1, 0, 0. The way the shuffle works is for each edge in the matching, you flip a coin. If the coin lands heads, you swap the cards at the endpoints. Here's another way of looking at it. How do we encipher x? <clears throat> well, for each round, if the current state is x, we're going to pair that with kt x or x. Now choose some canonical representative from the pair, say the max. You could use the min, doesn't matter. And call that x hat. Now apply ft to x hat giving a bit b. That's the coin flip. If b equals 1, then we replace x by kt x or x. And we do this for r rounds. How does decryption work? Well, notice that each round is its own inverse. So to do decryption, you do the same thing, except you reverse the order of the rounds. An interesting feature of our cipher is that the result is always of the form x, xored with some subset of the k's. But note that it's not linear because this set is chosen non-adaptively in, in a complicated way. Now some theoretical setup. Uh, suppose you have a random permutation pi and an adversary queries pi and pi inverse, then outputs a bit b, which is his guess as to whether the permutation is pi or a uniform permutation. His advantage is defined as the probability that b is 1 if it's pi minus the probability if it's a uniform permutation. The NCPA advantage 
is when you, when you limit to adversaries that ask non-adaptive queries, and they can only query pi, so that they can make only forward queries. With CCA advantage, there's no such restriction. Well, we're gonna use a, um, a nice theorem of Maurer, Pietschok, and Renner, which says that if you have a cipher with good NCPA advantage, if you run that and then you run an independent copy of the inverse, then the result has good CCA advantage. Now in our context, swap or not has the same distribution as its inverse. So this says that we can lift from NCPA security to CCA security, provided that we simply double the number of rounds. So now let me state our concrete bounds. Um, well, I've given the formula here for the advantage. I just did that so you can see that the constants that we get aren't very big. The, the summary is down below, and it says that if the number of queries is at most one minus epsilon times the size of the do domain, then the advantage is small, provided that you do at least big O of n rounds. So here's a, um, Here's a plot of the best known upper bounds on CCA advantage versus the log of the number of queries for various ciphers. Here the domain is 0, 1 to the 64. So on the left we have four rounds of balanced Feistel and then six rounds of balanced Feistel. Next it's eight passes of the Thorpe shuffle where a pass is defined as n rounds, or 64 rounds, then 20 passes of the Thorpe shuffle, and over on the right we have eight passes of swap or not and 20 passes. Now let me give a sketch of the proof. So by the Maurer, Pietschak, and Renner results, we can assume a non-adaptive adversary who makes forward queries. Now suppose for simplicity that, that he queries 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. It's related to the following game. Do R swap or not shuffles? Now turn over the cards labeled 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. Now before each step, the adversary is going to guess at the location of the next card. If he guesses right, he wins K dollars if there were K possibilities. But he pays one dollar each step to play. So notice that if this were a uniform permutation, then it would be a fair game. I claim that if the adversary's expected net winnings is close to zero, then the adversary has small advantage in the sense I defined earlier. So it remains to show that the adversary's expected net winnings is small. Now I claim that this is true even if when we turn over a card, we reveal its entire trajectory. So now suppose the adversary has made his guesses for 0, 1, and 2, so I've turned those over. But I've also shown the adversary where those cards were located at each intermediate stage. This is like turning over cards 0, 1, and 2 initially, and then leaving those cards face up throughout the whole process. So the face-up cards, I'll call those uncovered. Now, inside the covered cards, those blue numbers, I've written the expected net winnings if the adversary guesses there. So notice initially we know that the card, the card three is in the third position, so he wins four. It's five minus the one dollar he paid to play, and the others are minus one. Now what happens after one step? Suppose that the <coughs> that the first KT matches position three with the top position. So now we don't know if card three was swapped or not in that first step. So the expected winnings becomes the average of four and minus one in position three and also in the top position. The other three covered cards are, are still minus one.
So let me write wi for the expected winnings if the adversary guesses i. The key variable is the max over i wi. It turns out it's easier to work with the variable I'll call w, which is the sum of the squared wi. And I claim that um, if the number of queries is at most 1 minus epsilon times the size of the domain, then the expected value of this thing at time t plus 1 is at most 1 minus epsilon over 2 times the expected value at time t. So we get this nice geometric decay in the expectation. So after sufficiently many rounds, it's likely to be very small. And hence, so is the max. Now, say that a covered card is good if it's matched to another covered card. So this situation is not good because we have a covered card that's matched with a zero. So we know, based on what the zero does, we know what the covered card does. So it doesn't change the value of wi. When two covered cards are good, if the expected winnings are wi and wj, then we replace both by the average, which I'll call w bar. Now, there's an identity that says if you have two numbers, then twice the average squared is equal to a half the sum of squares plus the product. But the thing is, the, uh, these cross terms wi, wj, have expectation zero. And that's because any covered card is equally likely to be matched with any other covered card. And the sum of the wj is zero. So when we're computing expectations, we can ignore these cross terms. And we see that good cards, we expect to contribute half as much to the sum of squares after one step. So recall w is this sum of squares. And we know that good cards, we expect to contribute half as much to the sum of squares after one step. Not good cards contribute the full amount to the sum of squares after one step. Now if you work it out, it follows that the expected sum of squares at time t plus 1, given the value at time t, is the probability of a covered card being good times a half the value at time t, plus the probability of being not good times the full value. Now, since the probability of being good plus the probability of being not good equals 1, this is the same as 1 minus a half the probability of being good times the value at time t. But we're assuming that um, a proportion, at least epsilon, of the cards are not queried. Hence a proportion of epsilon of the cards are, are covered, which means the probability of being good is at least epsilon. So we get that the expected sum of squares at time t plus 1 is at most 1 minus epsilon over 2 times the value at time t. So this implies that the, um, that the expectation decays geometrically as I claimed earlier. This completes the proof sketch. So in the last minute, I, I want to talk about uh, first how to use swap or not to construct a confusion diffusion cipher. So far in the talk, I've been assuming the random functions are, uh, I've, I've been, assu been assuming that the FT are random functions. To make a confusion diffusion cipher, we want to use an FT with a smaller description. What we propose in the paper is to specify ft by an n-bit string lt, and then define ft of x hat as the inner product of lt and x hat. We don't know how many rounds to suggest to make this into a good cipher. We'd love to hear from cryptanalysts on this issue. And finally, how to handle a general domain a non-binary domain, suppose that uh, the domain is a finite abelian group G, then the cipher works the same as before, except now we choose KT uniformly at random from G, and we pair 
each x with kt minus x. Okay, that's my talk. Thank you very much.